Hello, and welcome to this video on energy conservation. Now, what this video is really going to highlight is the link between work and energy. And ultimately, it will arrive at energy conservation, but we're going to take a little bit of a journey to get there. So we're going to start off by looking at the link between work and kinetic energy. And then we're going to think about how we can split that work and think about the various types of forces and see, for instance, the link for a conservative force between its work and its potential energy, and then use all of that combined and a little bit about dissipative forces to come up with some final statement about energy conservation in a system as a whole. So let's start off by thinking about what is the link between work and kinetic energy. So we've already seen uh, several examples where we've concluded that the network on a system is either if positive, helping more motion to occur in that system, or if negative, sort of hindering that motion. And we've introduced kinetic energy as a way of describing that energy of motion. So it should be no surprise that the work kinetic energy theorem is simply that the change in kinetic energy of a system is equal to the network that we do. So if we've got a positive network that we have um, done on the system, then our kinetic energy increases. And that's what that statement says. And if we do negative work, clearly the kinetic energy decreases. So that's a good starting point. I'm going to write it over here because we're going to manipulate this as we go along. So now let's think about what we really mean by W net. Well, W net has a lot of components. The first thing, as I said, that we might want to distinguish between is whether or not we're talking about work done by conservative forces or work done by non-conservative forces. So we'll break that into two pieces, one which is the work done by conservative forces and one by non-conservative forces. So what is the work done by a conservative force? What is this WC? In order to get at that, we just have to think a little bit. So for instance, if I'm lifting something, then the amount of extra work it takes to just lift, say, this marker, by that much height is actually the amount of work that I've sort of stored in this thing. And that work that we're storing is what we're talking about as being the potential energy associated with actually the force of gravity. But remember that we want to talk about the work done by gravity, not by me in lifting this, but the work done by gravity as I lift this. Now the force that gravity is exerting if I'm moving this at constant speed is equal and opposite to the force I'm exerting. So the work done by gravity is the negative of the work that I have done. But the work I do is clearly the work that I'm storing in the system. And the work done by gravity is the negative of that. So then we can simply write down that the work done by gravity in this case is the negative of the change in potential energy. Because the potential energy is, again, basically the work that I do, the work that I've stored in the system by lifting the marker up. So we've got this simple relationship. So we can go ahead and replace that here with the negative of the change in potential energy. We still have our non-conservative forces doing some work. And all of that still is delta k. So then what? Well, obviously, the next step would be to bring delta k plus delta u over to that side and talk about the work done by non-conservative forces. So this thing, we can, of course, realize one step further. That's just delta k plus u as a whole. So that's the change in the mechanical energy of the system. And that's still equal to the work by non-conservative forces. So now let's think about the work done by non-conservative forces. So the non-conservative forces come in two forms. One is simply an external force, like me pushing a box. That's my extra applied force that's external to it. But there's also a non-conservative force potentially of friction. If I'm working against any friction, that friction is a dissipative force. So this non-conservative force business actually contains two terms. So the change in the mechanical energy of the system is going to be equal to basically the work done by external forces and 
the work done by dissipative forces. Now what, are, now what do dissipative forces do? So when they do work, they steal energy from the system and they increase the temperature. So in that case, not only do we have this relationship of the non-conservative forces, but we can write down that the dissipative force is minus, the work done by the dissipative force is minus of the change in temperature. Because if the dissipative force is doing work, it's doing negative work on the system, but the temperature is increasing. And that's a higher thermal energy. So that's why we've got a negative sign there. And so we can just write this thing then handily as the external forces plus negative of the change in E thermal. And of course, we can bring that to the other side. And so we can finally write down that the work by external forces, those not in our system, is the change in the mechanical energy of the system and the change in temperature of the system, basically, the thermal energy of that system. And that right there is energy conservation. If there are no external forces doing any work, so the net external work is zero, which basically means the net forces applied to the system that are external to the system are zero, then energy, you know, the change in the mechanical and change in thermal, is going to be zero, which is saying that it's conserved. So you'll be talking about conversions potentially between kinetic and potential energy as the system evolves, but also changes into thermal energy. But the sum of that represents the fact that energy is overall conserved. So all you're doing is transforming back and forth between kinetic and potential, or possibly converting some of that mechanical energy into thermal energy. Okay, so that's energy conservation. On the other hand, we can take it one step back and we can look at this one. So if we want to talk about the conservation of mechanical energy, right, that's the useful energy, so maybe we're more interested in that than knowing about the fact that our thermal energy is also conserved, then in addition to making the external forces be zero, we can make dissipative forces be zero, and that then tells us that the change in mechanical energy is zero if there are no dissipative or external forces doing work. And in that case, then the mechanical energy is conserved. So we've now got a nice criteria for when we can actually talk about the conservation of mechanical energy in a system. It's whenever both of those terms are zero, so there are no net external forces and there's no dissipative forces, so that there are no works associated with those. And in that case, the mechanical energy of the system is conserved. So in summary, the network that's done on the system is of course equal to the change in kinetic energy of the system. And then we realize we could split it into two pieces, thinking about the conservative forces and realizing that we could associate those with potential energies. And so we'll represent them here in that fashion. That gave rise to basically saying that if we have no work by non-conservative forces, then the mechanical energy of the system is conserved, or more explicitly, mechanical energy is conserved if the work by external forces is zero and the work by dissipative forces is zero. We saw also along the way, or taking a step further, that overall, total energy of the system is conserved as long as there's no external work being done on the system.